Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning into Molly's Salon. This is our weekly program every Thursday evening where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. And we're living in a critical time in American history. This will be a moment that we will remember for the rest of our lives. With the COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter and an amazing election uh, that was just settled on Saturday with President-elect Biden and uh, our Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Um, our guests are a variety of artists and leaders discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us glimmers of hope for the future. And my guests this week are Kenneth Lynn, award-winning playwright and screenwriter uh, for uh, different projects that I'll talk to you about in just a minute. Uh, and he wrote a play called Kleptocracy, which we premiered at Arena Stage. Betsy Morgan, who's a wonderful actor and singer, uh, both on Broadway, and you might have seen her at Arena Stage in Carousel. And Mary Catherine Nagel, who's a terrific playwright and a partner at Pipe Stem Law. And you saw her work with Sovereignty, which we will talk a little bit about as well. Kenneth Lynn's plays have been seen at theaters all across the country, including Second Stage and Alliance Theater and North Light Theater and Alley Theater, People's Light, South Coast Rep, Williamstown, Marin Theater County uh, Company, East West Players, and of course, Arena wow. Stage. He works in television as a co-producer and writer with CBS. There he is on several projects. He was the creator of American Way for USA Networks and he's writing uh, the new Star Trek, uh, the new Silence of the Lambs, and has written for Netflix House of Cards. And Ken, it's so great to see you. Great to see you. And I know, I know we might have a little bit of sound outside because you've got kids playing outside, right? So we're going to yeah. get some life out there. In the middle of the afternoon here in Los Angeles. So <laughs> my neighbor's kids, they're, you know, it's like a Huck Finn kind of thing. My neighbors, like the neighborhood kids play at the fence right next to my window. So you might be hearing some kids. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, Ken, I'm so curious because of your writing for House of Cards. Mm -hmm. How, um, when you look at this moment that we're in right now, mm -hmm. was this... Um, was House of Cards a preamble to this? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I used to be of several minds about it, right? I used to think that, oh, like we've, we've uh, injected this, like, you know, we, we created this portrayal of toxic politics um, and, and, and has that shaped our thinking? And, and sort of, you know, the more I get away from that show um, and the more I sort of realize that maybe we, you know, tapped into a moment, right? Uh, there are a lot of politicians at the time that were big fans of the show, so we would hear from them. Um, and I was always hoping that they would write and say, oh, your show is so cynical. That's not the way politics is, right? But um, the message that we heard several times was, this, is, this show feels closest to what the real experience of being in politics is like um, from you know, active you know, high level politicians in the United States government. Um, and, you know, that always really disappointed me because I was always hoping that they were going to come up and upbraid us for being cynical and getting in the way of progress. But instead, you know, they were consuming the show saying that's my life. So, um, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, hearing some of the, some of the moves that have been going on in Washington, definitely I'm reminded of our storylines. You know, and I think, man, I wish we had some of those writers in our room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, you know, I certainly wrote an election, like a, an episode where an election was overturned. Um, I, you know, I wrote an episode where the president was, um, was defining unemployment as a um, natural disaster and trying to access FEMA funding because of it, you know? Um, and I believe, you know, Trump tried to, tried to suggest that I think immigration or something was a natural disaster as well. So, you know, there was a, there, there was a lot of things, you know, I, I constantly like would read a headline and say, I think we did, a, did an episode about that, so. 
Um, but uh, okay, I'm a little bit nervous to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Uh, so as a screenwriter who's been able to see into the future, where's the, where's the future going in the next uh, couple months? Politics? You know, I really don't know. Um, I think that there is something that's inevitable that's happening, which is that the demographics of the country are changing, right? And that's one thing that I think you can predict with certainty. And, uh, you know, probably a lot of the way politics is right now has something to do with that inevitable certainty. Yep. Uh, and I think that that is not sort of discussed enough, that our country is just simply changing in fundamental ways. And that can't come without upheaval. You know, that can't come without transfers of power. And when you look at how quickly and rapidly and dramatically the demographics of our country are changing, then you really shouldn't be surprised at anything that hap that's happening. Because we are asking a lot of everybody um, to, to, to be living in a different country in 50 years. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well said. Well said. And I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. And I am surprised that they're not talking about it more because clearly that was not just an underlining uh, force, but that was a big part of uh, the whole wave of what happened mm -hmm. and what happened in terms of the vote for President Trump as well. Well, and I think if you look at it in those ways, you start be being able to see how things are rational. Um, and ideally you start to be able to have some compassion. Yeah. Um, because I can really understand what's happening. And I definitely, you know, as a person whose family ended up in America because of a political, because of political upheaval that was happening in China and in Asia, you know, which led to a diaspora that led my family here. Like these, the, like political upheaval, it has real consequences on people's lives. Um, and like when you can see how it's real and rational, then I think you, there's a way to get to compassion. And then from there, then maybe ever, anything's possible. It's true, it's true. So Ken, we've, we've just got a few minutes left, but I would love uh, to have you uh, talk a bit about the Power Play Commission that you have at Arena. What are you, what are you writing? I know you're in the middle of it uh, right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a play about the um, Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and so, I, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that the only um, law that was ever passed in Congress, which specifically excluded a race of people from America, was the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so, so people like me are the only people that have ever legally been tried to be pushed out of, Amer of America. Um, so, you know, I, I was very excited um, at my slot for the power play that it really encompassed this, you know, and I think that it's something that feels timely now um, with a lot of the sort of like sino xenophobia that we're experiencing. Um, and, you know, but, you know, like I also haven't written a comedy in a while. Um, so it's going to be a play about how you know, this, this sort of acclaimed writer, historian writes a book about the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and then tries to make a television show out of it. Um, and it gets basically turned into a Kung Fu serial. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, like, like I've written some kind of like muscular political scene, scenery chewing sort of plays um, and I haven't written a full on comedy in a while. Um, so the idea like writing exclusion play act, a comedy star starring, Asian people, um, that seems like the good thing to be writing for the country right now, you know? Like I'm hoping to be able to keep talking about the things that I wanna talk about, but also, you know, like you, you know me in life, like I try to have a sense of humor about everything. And um, I kind of like, that's, that's where my, that's where the muse is taking me right now. Can we laugh about this a little bit? Because if we can't, we're gonna be crying a lot more. <laughs> yeah. You're actually right. Uh, can we laugh about it? Can we have compassion? And uh, can we have optimism about the future too? Yeah, I think we can. I do too. I do too. 
Well, Ken, thank you so much for coming. I, I know you're, you're super busy with all your different projects and uh, so proud of you as a writer and uh, so pleased to have known you over 20 years. Yeah, I miss you. And I I'm miss you too. I'm hoping to see you very soon. All right, much love. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye -bye. Betsy Morgan has performed in theaters all over the country on Broadway and off Broadway. And as I mentioned, Arena's audiences will remember her from Carousel where she was absolutely extraordinary. Beautiful voice, wonderful acting. And here she is right now. Hi, Betsy. Hi, how are you? Good. Well, now here's the really interesting thing. Four years ago was right as we a little bit less than four years was right as we went into rehearsal uh, for Carousel. You found out that you were pregnant and we, uh, we opened like a, a day or two after, after the election. And then here we are talking four years later. When you asked me to do this, it was before the election. And I mean, this evening, when you asked me to be part of this evening and knowing that there was a possibility that we could be in two different places tonight, um, I was holding my breath a little bit because when I went into rehearsal for Carousel, I was um, pregnant in real life. I was pregnant in the show and I was um, portraying this woman who um, stuck up for something that's a little bit hard to justify. And I felt really, really good about that up until um, election day. And all of a sudden there was like, a, there was a draining of, um, I wanna say a bit of hope and understanding as to why I had to really do some soul searching as to why this was um, something that I wanted to tell every night. And, um, and the story that I wanted to tell my son, I, I had to kind of reevaluate what it means to be um, a mom to a white boy. Um, and, and so after Saturday, I, um, I find myself coming to the conversation um, a little bit, uh, I, I mean, I'm still holding my breath a little bit, um, but, I feel like the seeping back in of, of hope and not just because Joe Biden is the president elect, but also because I, um, I feel like I understand the world a little bit better. I understand the country a little bit better, um, not just as the perspective of a, a person who um, is living today with such a split country, but also now that baby is three and a half years old and um, just kind of changes the way you see things a little bit. Absolutely. And I think this moment for women, which we talk about, but we don't talk about maybe as much as we need to, absolutely groundbreaking to have Kamala Harris as the vice president and to have a black woman and an Indian woman. I mean, it's, it's really an incredible moment for us because it hasn't happened. <laughs> and, and here we are, here we are in this time of the double pandemics. And it's a woman that uh, breaks through. I mean, I think it's just thrilling for us. I remember um, before I knew that my son was going to be a boy, there was uh, a, it was like a little baby outfit that said, it was a ballerina outfit. And it said, when I grow up, I want to be a ballerina. And it was crossed out and it said president underneath. And I bought that. And I was like, cause I don't care if it's a boy or if it's a girl, like they're gonna wear this <laughs> because it was, I just thought it was the coolest thing that it's not like, sure, grow up and be a ballerina, that's fine. But also like you can be president and to have somebody standing up there that I can actually be like, look, you can, like you actually can do that to point to somebody and to, put, to like show my son, like you see that lady, like, you can be her vice president. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, seeing um, the there's a there's a 
image that's out now on the internet that's all the other vice presidents from before and then Kamala Harris. And it's just, I mean, it's shocking it's when shocking. you see all of the men and suddenly it's, it's her, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And there's also one that has the picture of Kamala and then behind her is the picture of, um, I forget the name of the statue, the defiant girl who stood in front of the bull. And it's the two of them standing kind of in shadow. And it's like, yeah, we, we will use our voices and we will stand up and we will make changes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Betsy, I wanna ask you a question about art. I mean, obviously you were drawn to Carousel because of the role, because it's Rogers and Hammerstein, because, because of what the play had to say. Why do you think that the gold standard musicals are uh, pieces that have continued to live on and have meaning for people, have resonance for people uh, in their lives? What I is it, it about them? I think in their best form, they, I think there's always merit to doing the golden age musicals as museum pieces, if I can kind of use that term to put them up in a way that is classically done and you use the traditional costumes or traditional set pieces, traditional performances. Um, I think there's always something to be said for that just to show people what they are. But I think what's really fascinating is when we take them and we put them up on stage in a way that makes us um, see them differently. And whether that's to shine a light on maybe ways that um, things were misperceived then or um, ways that things haven't changed so much or ways that things have changed. I think that that is fascinating for audience members. There's also, it has to be said that there's structure to both the songs and the tunes and the story writing that is pretty extraordinary. And it, it carries an audience through in a way that is um, pretty amazing. But if you take a story like Carousel, which is um, traditionally done with a woman playing Julie who maybe isn't her own Kamala Harris, who wouldn't stand up, who wouldn't be as strong. And all of a sudden you plug in a woman who's gonna still say the words as they're written in the script, but but with strength and with determination, it does change the way we look at it. And it gives something that hasn't changed that much, women in difficult relationships, women in abusive relationships, that's still around, that hasn't gone anywhere. It, it lets us look at that, not just through Carousel, but also through whatever lens um, people are looking, like their own personal lens. That's not we think that these are antiquated musicals, but there's nothing that happened in Carousel that isn't happening every single day. There's nothing in The King and I that we don't still see. Like there, maybe some of the writing needs to be um, laughed at a little bit because it's slightly antiquated, but those situations, those feelings, there's nothing about that that we can't still recognize today. They really do stand the test of time in a lot of ways. Yeah, just, oh yeah. And re-examining. Yeah. They were, they were uh, brilliant writers and we can keep reinterpreting them for, for our time. So um, we've only got a couple minutes left, but I wanna know um, where are you finding hope these days? Where are you, you know, is it in things that you're reading? Is it in your family? Is it in music? Where, where do you find it? I, when I think about, um, the things that I worry, I worry about people. So I, I worry about the actors and the artists and everyone that goes into a creative process. But when I think about as artists having stories to tell and having things to write about and to be passionate about, I don't see that going anywhere. And so I sit back and look at what's happening in our country, the positive, the negative, the device of like all of the, the polarization. And I know 
that we have some tremendous art coming up and that people are gonna to wanna to come and see that art and that it is gonna be powerful and funny and sad and beautiful. I just know that this time is gonna bring so much um, truly incredible art and people are writing it and people wanna see it. Beautiful, Betsy. I completely agree. It's going to be a synthesis of everything that's happened over the last eight or nine or 10 months or however long it goes. It's all going to be compressed. It's going to come shooting out at all the audiences. And they'll be like all different things too. Like there's going to be hilarity, like the stuff that people have gone through in their tiny little apartments like mine or, or the heartbreak that comes with losing so many lives. It, it's just going to really run the gamut as far as what people want to say. I agree. So great to see you, Betsy. You too. Can't wait to see you in person. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. Much love. Bye. Thank you. Mary Catherine Nagel is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She's a playwright uh, who's had commissions from places like Arena Stage, the Rose Theater, uh, Portland Center Stage, Denver Center. Now, she's also unusual because she's a partner at Pipestem Law, where she works to protect tribal sovereignty and the inherent right of Indian nations to protect their women and children from domestic violence and sexual assault. She's authored numerous briefs in federal appellate courts including uh, working on a brief, I believe, with the United States Supreme Court. So Mary Catherine, it's so great to see you. I'm gonna talk about sovereignty in a minute, but I think people would be really curious about this intriguing personal story that you are both a working lawyer and a working playwright. How does that, how do you do that? Uh, without very much sleep. <laughs> It, uh, it, it, it's very challenging at times. I, I've actually been blessed to do a lot of uh, Zoom uh, panels and speeches to college students, many of whom have been reading Sovereignty since it got published, which is really exciting. And I get that question all the time. Uh, and, I, and I just want to be honest with folks like, like, I love it. It is a dream come true. But just know that, you know, it's a little bit of a personal sacrifice, too, because I've got, I basically have two full-time careers and, and that's a decision I've made. I've, I've decided to do both full-time and I love them both. And I'm sort of addicted to them both. And there might come a time in my life where I have to say, you know what, I'm going to go do this for a couple of years. And it means I can only write, or I can only be a lawyer because of a job or a post or a, you know, um, you know, writing on a TV show, I would have to most likely move to LA and I'm, you know, you might remember when we were when we were starting crossing the Nishoshi at Portland Center Stage. I missed the first half of the first day rehearsal because I was arguing in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals that morning. Rushed to the airport and flew to rehearsal. You know, so I've been able to make both work, and that's also been because I'm very blessed to have a law partner who supports my writing, um, who believes in my writing, and who understands that at certain times I'm physically working with, you know, I'm, I get the work done, but I might not be in the office. I might be, you know, at arena stage in rehearsal every day. Um, and I, and I, my, my, my collaborators in the theater have also been incredibly supportive um, of like, okay, yes, we'll move around the first day of rehearsal to accommodate your schedule to argue in the 10th circuit court of appeals, you know? Um, but so I'm very fortunate to have amazing collaborators. Well, it certainly feeds your writing. Um, now, we produced Sovereignty, I think, in 2017 at Arena Stage, and we just had a wonderful online reading of it for the Carlos Museum at Emory mm -hmm. uh, in Georgia uh, just a few days ago. Um, a number of people in the audience are going to recognize the name Sovereignty because people loved your production, um, but it would be great for you to just talk a little bit um, about the play to uh, remind people of it. Sure, so the play 
it was based in two time periods and pretty much every actor plays someone in the past and someone in the present and there's a through line like you you see their character arc from the past through the present and maybe even back around again as they evolve through the play and it follows the story of a young woman named Sarah Ridge Paulson who is a Cherokee Nation citizen and direct descendant of John Ridge and Major Ridge and they were leaders of the Cherokee Nation um, during the 1820s and 30s when Andrew Jackson won his campaign to, for US president on a campaign platform that promised to eradicate tribal nations from the southeastern part of the United States because we were, quote, racially inferior and uncivilized. And uh, so my great, great, great grandfather, John Ridge, fought those policies and fought removal and worked with the principal chief at the time, John Ross, uh, um, to fight that. And they even won a huge case in the Supreme Court in 1832 called Wooster v. Georgia. But Andrew Jackson refused to enforce the Supreme Court's decision. The Supreme Court's decision basically made it illegal for him uh, to remove tribal nations because it said the only the only sovereign with jurisdiction over a tribal nation's land is that tribal nation, not the United States, not the state of Georgia. And Andrew Jackson refused to obey the Supreme Court. And so, you know, it's it's just interesting. I, I know there's a lot of questions today in the United States about, you know, what will the how will the courts handle all these, whatever you believe, if you believe there's merit there or not, these allegations of fraud in our election will be going through the courts. But also, if the courts don't give the, the president the answer he wants, will will he abide this constitutional framework we have here in this country that's, that creates a separation of powers? We, we are not supposed to, according to our constitution, have an executive branch that can do things like what Andrew Jackson did and what President Trump seems to maybe be trying to do. We'll see. I hope, I hope he makes the right decision, but uh, right now he's certainly not saying things that would lend in that direction. Oh, I think he'll make the right decision. It feels like he's moving toward that now. Um, so I'm really curious uh, what your thoughts are because I think that you know President-elect Biden and you know his thinking um, or what, what he's thought about when he was in the Senate and as vice president. Are there things that you think that he will be doing for Indian country uh, now that he has moved into this position? Yes, I've I've been honored to have met him um, very briefly many years ago, but I and I was there on March seventh, twenty thirteen, when he invited Diane Millich, who is from the Southern Ute Tribe in Colorado, which is mentioned in Sovereignty. But I watched Diane Millich introduce Vice President Joe Biden, and then of course President Obama at the VAWA signing ceremony. A very impactful day. Um, I do know that President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris together have pledged to take a very hard look at the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant. They've made very clear they're going to work on reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act, and not just a, a clean reauthorization from 2013, which had victories in it, but to further address the different categories of criminal jurisdiction, tribal criminal jurisdiction, the Supreme Court erased in 1978. So they're going to be working uh, in VAWA and to address Oliphant to restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over crimes committed by Indians on tribal lands. And that is one of the biggest issues we face in Indian country today. It's why we have uh, the MMIW crisis. It's why women, Native women are more likely to be raped, sexually assaulted, or murdered than any other population in the United States. And he's pledged to do that. I think, I know he will. He's very committed to, I think, issues of safety for women, but especially for Native women. Um, he's demonstrated that. And I'm very confident, too, that he will be um, appointing Native women to key positions in his administration. And I think that will uh, be very impactful and, and change the course over the next four years. And I think, as you know, my partner, Suzanne Blue Star Boy, worked with Biden when they were focused on uh, VAWA and when it was uh, she was able to um, support, help uh, make it happen so that there was uh, kind of a, a piece there for uh, Indian country. And uh, that's, that's continued forward. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a lot of happiness in this household about him as well. Um, I have one last question for you. 
Um, and I'm curious about where your thinking is going. When you start to examine what kind of new art do you think we will be seeing in the coming years? Given everything that's happened with the pandemic, all the changes we've been going through as a, as a field, what are, you, what are you looking forward to, Mary Catherine? You know, I think that um, one, of course, a lot of things are happening on digital platforms that never happened before COVID. And I think everyone sort of fully expects that. But I also think that we're, we're sort of at this exciting moment in the American theater where theaters are producing native work. And we're, we're seeing different opportunities like, you know, um, the Montana Repertory Theater out there, you know, creating a commission where they're, look, they're actively looking to commission a native writer to write on native issues for their theater. And they're putting out the call and they're calling native writers and asking folks to apply, submit a written statement. You know, I'm seeing all sorts of theaters say, we want to invest in native theater. And I think what we're seeing, it was, we're just seeing more in, we're seeing theaters become more inclusive. And, you know, I think we're also talking a lot in the, in the greater political scheme of how the, the demographics of the United States is changing, right? And so I think what's really wonderful is I think we're, we're also seeing American theater start to ref, better reflect America, just like Vice President-elect Biden has said, my cabinet is going to reflect America. And I think that, I think one, um, that will help uh, that'll make American culture better, stronger, right? I also think it will save the theater because it's going to keep the theater relevant. Um, because we're going to we're going to actually be speaking to as, as as theater artists, we're going to be speaking to the most pressing issues of the day. So it's actually I think just a very exciting time to be making theater, um, despite COVID and all those challenges. Um, we know this will pass, and when we get back in the room together, I just I can't wait. I can't wait to, to start making theater again. Well, it's so great to see you, Mary Catherine. And I agree with everything you said. And uh, I do think it's going to be an exciting time. You and Betsy both talked about that. You and Ken are talking about the demographics. Uh, you're both talking about it from the perspective of uh, writers. Just thanks for being here. And I'm so glad to know you. Thank you so much, Molly. Much love. Bye-bye. So what a trio, right? Um, really, really uh, interesting thinkers uh, in the American theater. My guests next week will be Tom Kitt, uh, playwright of Next to Normal, Jagged uh, Little Pill, and of course, uh, lyricist. Uh, it's gonna be, and uh, composer. That's gonna be really exciting to have uh, Tom here. Tara Sussman Pena, who's a senior technical expert in IREX's Center for Applied Learning and Impact, and Susan Fierstenberg, who's a visual artist in America, how could this happen? And uh, Susan is the person who has uh, created the outdoor visual piece of 240,000 white flags, one marking a place for every death because of COVID that is up now, and I think it's still up, or maybe it's maybe it's almost down, that is uh, right around the RFK Stadium here. It's, it's an extraordinary sculptural piece. Uh, so you want to tune in to uh, hear these uh, wonderful thinkers and artists. Today's gift of art. Have you ever wondered how productions come to life? Here's a peek behind the curtain. Arena Stage Technical Director Natalie Bell is a scenic artist, architectural planner, and caring leader all rolled into one. She reflects on some of her favorite projects and offers us just a glimpse into how she makes magic happen on stage. So let's listen to Natalie. Natalie Bell. I'm the technical director at Arena Stage. I've been working in theater for almost 20 years. I've done everything from tying wigs to building costumes. I've even done uh, I've even done lights and sound. I actually started out originally wanting to be an actor. Um, and then I went into doing scenery, building and painting the scenery as well as installing and 
programming automated scenery. Um, but I've spent the last 16 years focusing on being the technical director and five of those years at Arena Stage. My favorite projects at Arena, the things that I usually enjoy the most are the ones that most people wouldn't really notice. Like for example, I think the, the brick walls from Newsies this last season, we had, there were these walls that were on the sides of the stage and the faces of them folded down to reveal footlights for the theater scenes. As we were in the design process, we ran into a problem where we realized that every scene shift was a lot of things moving in and out, and we had to come up with a way to to shift the scenes without having to have a lot of people doing it all of the time. So I threw this idea out, and it started out as a series of just whiteboard doodles, and my associate, Zach Follenkamp, really just took off with it and turned it into this fully pneumatic system with the pneumatic pistons built in and then the, the best detail out of all of them. So when they fold down, they, all you see is these beautiful shelves with these Edison lights in there and they really just fit the room perfectly. It's those projects where you get down to those little things and it's always really satisfying for me to see those whiteboard doodles become just something that looks effortless on stage. Those are the ones that I love. There's not much better in this business than to see somebody approach a new skill with a little bit of unsurety and a little trepidation and then to turn that into a new level of understanding and watch them go on to another project with a whole new level of confidence. The things that we build, they're not really meant to last, but those relationships and those skills, those do. Just, I love getting to work side by side with people who genuinely care about the end results without all of the egos. You know, a group, a group of people that really works well together. It's not an easy thing to find, and I love that about Arena. I miss them.